Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you very much for being here. Friday evening, it's cold, so I really appreciate your presence here. So this presentation, this lecture, is divided in two parts. The first part, I hope you are there for the concerts. It's based on performances that happened last month in October. And the second part is based on performance going to happen today after this lecture. If you're not there for the concerts, it's okay. We have the excerpts from those concerts for you tonight. So what these composers, these works bring together, in this moment here, what I'm focusing on is the message, but the feeling they are translating. So this message from their hearts, how they translate these feelings into sound. The recordings, the excerpts, the Mio and um, host, the concerts from last month, concert band and University of Michigan Symphony Band. So live performances. And abduction from the Seraglio, Mozart and the Rauta Barra is from reliable sources. So we have a good parallel to understand what's going to happen later on today. Let's begin. Darius Mio, French composer, he studied at the Paris Conservatoire and he had influence not only from the professors he studied with, but also the surroundings and other life experiences, as all of us. So he became someone, not only as a person, but as a composer. So this influence, the Russian ballet, the opera comique, and the musical Wagner was not learned in the Paris Conservatoire, but was learned in this moment he was there, the years he was studying, and all the cultural life of Paris. Also, jazz was the influence of the United States and Brazilian music when he um, visited Brazil in a diplomatic mission with a friend. So all these elements, these composers, this influence, came together to build his musical idiom. Sweet Frances, written in 1944. Let's just start by saying that, like this date, he was a French composer, Jewish composer. If he wrote something in 1944, he was probably not in France. Sadly, but true. So he was here in the United States. And this piece has different meanings, but they come all together because he's honoring his land by showing five provinces and the melodies from these places, but at the same time showing gratitude to the Americans for a, a, the hope of a liberated France, and also a little bit of anger towards the Nazis, and uh, the agony, the horror of the war. So different movements showing all these feelings and bringing us with him. So, the core of his music, and here it's not different, is the melody. So fun fact, he used many, many melodies here, different melodies that he claimed at the very beginning to be all folk tunes, as he says in the, the program note. But a few researchers were trying to understand the origins of these folk tunes. And after years and years, they couldn't find the origin of all the folk tunes. For example, the fifth movement, there are five melodies, and they have no idea. Like, okay, we checked the books, we checked, uh, they even asked his wife, and like, did he say anything about that? And like, uh, no. <laughs> so the clue is, there was an interview, I can't remember the date, but there is an interview. <laughs> he said, uh, I use the folk tunes, the existing folk tunes, in a way that I can modify, I can create, and people believe these folk tunes are actually my melodies. And sometimes I create melodies and use in a folk tune manner that people believe they are actually existing folk tunes. So he didn't do that just to be tricky, it was just his compositional technique. Okay, let's see how it goes. Um, so as I said, the, the sound from his heart here is all united, so the, the anger, honoring, and also the gratitude and the horrors of the war all coming together in one piece, in one work. The first movement 
brings the hope of a liberated France. So it's still uplifting, very happy, as you can see in this excerpt. In the second section, the B section. And the third and the sixth section. here to continue the mus musical discourse is to repeat the B section and to repeat the A section. So he has a form. Composers have this way to communicate that sometimes we, as we are listening, we are as audience, we just know there is a flow in the message, but they actually think about that and there is a structure. That's what we call the form in music. And here it is what we call the arch form. The third movement is back the, the vivid atmosphere, energy from the first movement. The reason is not because the battle was easier there, but let's see like two main cities in this province, that is Paris and Versailles. So, because of the cultural life, the meaning of these cities for him, he brings back this happy, uplifting feeling. This is the beginning of the movement, and it's the same energy throughout the movement. This band. how he, he works with the melodies here, with the tunes. This is what he does. <laughs> it's a little bit different, but um, it's fascinating to see how he combines the, the themes. The fourth movement is the, what I used to call the emotional climax of the suite, because this province was, had the, the bloodiest battles in this place. Historically, throughout the centuries, is a problematic place, not anymore, but because of uh, the borders, you see here in the map, you have Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, Italy, and France. So all the countries around, they always disputed this uh, territory. But here, was there is a special meaning for the World War II. And what Neil does to communicate this horror of this uh, region witnessed was to build a movement that goes, it's always increasing in intensity. So what you're going to hear now is like few spots showing how he builds this intensity always ever increasing.
and the very end. To bring that joy of the liberated friends and uh, all the, the, the blood, the horror is back there, even that we have the emotional climax of the piece. So now we can relax and enjoy. This is the first theme, the first melody. The second one brings the military aspect the music back. And this lovely tender melody that's the next. So, and what he does, as I, I showed uh, to you before in the other movement, when he combines different melodies, so overlapping these melodies, like here. And between these sections, he creates bridges, but here to be like victorious, the end of the war, they are very short fanfares. The first one in C major. And later on, use the same, but different key. So he should end this suite in the same way. So the quote at the end of the piece, he takes the same idea, but he makes it longer. It's an augmented fanfare, but now in G major, in the very end of the song. Our next stop, Gustav Holst. So speaking of spiritual people, he didn't believe music was just entertainment, but was something for eternity. He also studied in a famous institution that was the Royal College of Music, and he also had influence not only from his professors, but music, the culture of life around this school. The music of Wagner is back as an influence, and a curious point here is the influence of his mother-in-law. Because he was very young and he saw these discussions like groups discussing about philosophy and religion. This influenced him not only to, as a faithful person, but to, to question about this universe we believe exists but we can't see. So he was always very curious about that and this is translated in his music. He was also a devoted teacher that was part of what he believed he should pass on the experience, the knowledge. So Hammersmith, Prelude and Scherzo, let's understand the title of the piece, it's a good start. So Hammersmith was a district of London, and Prelude and Scherzo are musical terms. What Prelude means? Means just opening. So it's the opening section of the piece. While Scherzo from the Italian means joke, play, and the music means a free form short with elements of fugue. So we see these two elements. We believe the form of the piece is going to be also based on these two elements only. But let's see what happens. This is the beginning.
it's different. Composers usually keep very calm in the prelude, but here he introduces a theme that disturbs this peaceful atmosphere that's even called, labeled, the, the challenge theme. First in the piccolo and the trumpet. Should be the end of the piece, right? That's prelude and scherzo done. No, remember, scherzo is a free form. So what he does here is to add a lento section that's totally different than the prelude and the scherzo. And he's highlighting solids. The first one is the clarinet. develops the scherzo, creates another section of the scherzo, a little bit shorter, and brings back in the end all the material together. The material from the prelude and all the melodies from the scherzo all together. So but you can't call this prelude because not the opening anymore, it's the closing. So we call postlude and this is how it sounds. the sound, what's the feeling he's trying to translate? Because now it, we are talking about the feelings from their hearts. So what's the point? The point is Gustav Holst lived for 39 years in Hammersmith and he admired so much the river, how calm and unchangeable the river was and how it is, it still is, and uh, how the, the crowded the streets population, how populated this area is. And these two elements together, these contrasting elements together, he loved that. So Hammersmith, the slow sections are about the river and the fast sections about the crowded streets of Hammersmith. So he's translating this feeling, how he felt so well in this area over 39 years. The next stop is a composer we don't know very well, maybe. <laughs> I hope I, maybe you heard about him once or twice. So, and uh, we can talk about Mozart for hours, and if you know me, you know I can talk for hours. So, <laughs> good news, bad news. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, but let's, let's just take one, one uh, aspect of his life. Mozart is different, that, that's, Okay, that's not something new. But if you see like the last two composers, he didn't study in a very famous institution. He didn't study with a famous composer. He studied with his father, and he learned by himself how to create his own music. So all the influence, but was still learning um, from other scores. And, uh, Another aspect of his life and his music is that if you know composers nowadays, you know they write, they may write like more than others, but 
they write music and they expect to have maybe a couple of masterpieces that are going to survive for eternity, as Post says. But Mozart wrote a lot of music and most of them are still being performed today after 200 years everywhere. So this is different. So we don't have to talk about him a lot of details, but that's one aspect as a composer that we always have to keep in mind, how different it was from his childhood to his death. So Abduction from the Serraglio, written in 1782. To understand <coughs> the, the, the context here, it's nice if we see the location. So he's in Vienna. Vienna is the border, you have the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs, and you have the Ottoman Empire. So after 1683, that was the Battle of Vienna, okay, they won, Habsburgs won, that's good, okay, they are safe there. But the cultural influence is very strong. It's mucho, very strong. And abduction from the Seraglio is the proof that the cultural influence is real. So the plot, as you can see, here, we will have elements of Turkish culture. Belmont, starting the story here, story time. Belmont was a noble from Spain. Due to a shipwreck, he could save himself, but he lost his companions. They didn't die, good news, okay. But they were captured. It's okay, right? He could just keep his life as a noble, rich man. Oh no, because among his companions was Constance, his beloved one. And Constance's maid, Blonde, and Belmont's servant, Pedrillo. And now they are all under the power of Pasha Selim. Okay, that's not good. <laughs> he has to rescue these people. And uh, believe me, Pasha Selim is not the problem. The problem here is Osman, as the picture shows very clear. That's the problem, okay? So Osman was the, the secured guy in the palace. So everything, he was the head of the security. So even the Pasha Selim was a good nobleman, Osman was still, he wanted to see blood. He wanted to see execution. To make this very short, and I think you appreciate, <laughs> Uh, Belmont actually succeed. He can make his way inside the palace. He, with the help of Pedrido, he can rescue them. And the Serraglio is the, the, where the women stay. It's the, the room in a Turkish palace. So he is rescuing Constanza from the Serraglio. So abducting her. That's why the title. So he was succeeding. It's very good, it's succeeding, but Osmin catches them and see them fleeing away. And he's so happy because now he has a reason actually to execute them. <laughs> yeah, he brings the four of them before uh, Pasha Selim. And Pasha Selim talking to Belmont, understanding the situation, he finds out that Belmont's father was who persecuted Pasha Selim's family back in the day <laughs> and brought misery and destruction to his family. So Osmin is even happier because huh, now the execution is guaranteed. Like, yes, that's great. But there is a plot twist there and you will not believe. I feel the help. So <laughs> Pasha Selim forgives them and let them go. He shows clemency, he shows forgiveness, mercy, because he didn't want to be like Belmont's father. He didn't want to persecute, to destruct them. He wanted to do the other way. That was the way to win this. But Osmin, of course, was not happy, right? He was expecting the, the revenge, right? So what we see here might be dramatic, like in the plot, but this is not an opera seria, it is a spiel. So we have a simple plot, and we have dialogues to make the story 
uh, more interesting and to also to make the story humorous. So the fight, looking forward to executing them, all this is not dark, but it's actually humorous. So in your program, the overture goes without saying, so I'm not going to play any excerpt. But the number two, you will see Belmont planning to rescue Constanza, and he is happy with that. He is full of love. So to make this even more dramatic, Osman was in love with Blonde, but Blonde was in love with Pedrillo. I know I shouldn't introduce this information in the beginning because it was too much love. So, <laughs> Osmin is trying to gain her heart, but she's against. So they have a fight, like, now I'm not going to be with you. And this is how the humorous fight is. <laughs> sincerity and tenderness and this is how Jesusmin rejoicing the fact that there will be executions. He didn't know about the forgiveness yet. <laughs> so, and as I told you, this is not going to be dark. This is going to be funny. <laughs> Century. 
you have to hire people to play the music again. So you're not going to hire a lot of people and have an opera stage in your room just because you want to listen to the music again. So someone had the idea of having eight wind instruments and paying someone not only to play, but to write arrangements of the favorites. And imagine abduction from the Serato favorites, like as we see Christmas favorites. So, and this person was actually the Emperor Joseph II, the most powerful man in this period, the Emperor of the Habsburgs. And he goes forward, he hires people, and he chooses the music and the arrangers. The first one was Vance, that's the, the arranger who wrote what we're going to listen tonight. And we have three and two more, that's Trebensi and Sadlak, very famous for writing uh, opera arrangements. They are not easy to write, you will see them not easy to play, but because it was so flexible, he could have like these eight people moving around the palace to play for him. <laughs> This was called like the harmonic music, so the harmony music. I invite you during the performance to take a moment, if you wanna take the entire moment, it's okay, but to take a moment during the performance to close your eyes and to imagine that you are in the palace as Joseph II was, because that's the musical experience you're going to have in a few minutes. Our last stop, the composer, Finnish composer, Raul Tabarra, he studied famous institution, Sibelius Academy, and also learned uh, from other composers by influence and studying with them a uh, short period of time. It's about his life that, uh, it's facts about his life that makes us understand his music. His father was an opera singer and a Lutheran cantor, so faith was very strong his house in a different way it was for a host. It was more to understand this universe than actually to develop the spiritual, faithful um, uh, spirit. And, um, but he was curious about religions in general. So you'll see here that his religiosity was ecumenical. So elements of different religions, even shamanistic elements. Suffering and faith comes together almost in general, but here very clear in his life. And when he was 14, no parents anymore. His dad died of cancer and his mom in the war. So it was very hard for him to learn music, but at the same time, all this suffering and the faith made him who he was not only as a person, but as a composer. So when he wrote Soldier's Mass, 1968, for the occasion of the 50th, anniversary of the Finnish army. He wanted to bring the religion, the faith, and the military elements together in one piece. So the first movement, Kyrie, following the, the order, the, the numbers, the, the parts of the Roman mass, is when he wants for forgiveness. Usually composers work in the key in a very slow music, contemplative music, but he changes the standpoint, and he is not from the sinner point of view, but like from the God, the most powerful, who can defeat everything, even sin. And this is how it sounds in his perspective. <laughs> energetic and up, um, 
broad in the sense not only musical but spiritual. So it's the moment of exaltation as it is in the Roman Mass. So he describes this into sounds in a way that we can, the best way possible, exalt not only God, but all the soldiers. That was the purpose of the piece. And this is how it goes. <laughs> Just to finish, to give an end to this um, piece in order to show the soldiers who fought and they enjoyed the glory of the fight but also deserve the rest. And the, this last movement brings back the same musical elements of the second movement and you can recognize right in the very beginning. So the sound from his heart, the, the idea, what he wanted to communicate here was all this religiosity, the faith and the hope and also the question life and death in one piece that was commissioned, but he was able to communicate all his beliefs in this music. So for better of a, uh, for a lack of a better quote, I use my own. Uh, <laughs> otherwise it would be another one very long, so. Uh, so this is the way he communicated. So what we saw tonight, the first two pieces, the second and the last two pieces that are going to be performed, are um, uh, composers who communicate the feelings, the anger, the honor, the gratitude, other composers communicating the joy of living in one area and the beauty of the surroundings. Another one, the desire for understanding, for mercy, for acceptance. And lastly, a composer communicating the depth of life and death. So, but all of them, different ways, different backgrounds, different sounds, they all communicated these sounds from their hearts. So thank you very much. We'll be back in 10 minutes. We have an intermission just to make a change. Um, I would like to uh, last note about the performance. Uh, the Soldier's Mass today is the very end of the Veterans Week. And Soldier's Mass is rarely performed. So I think it comes in a good moment to dedicate the performance to all the veterans. So I hope you enjoy the performance, Mozart first and Soldier's Mass right after. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presence.